Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends. How are you? It feels like it's been forever. I've been through the fire, to the limit, to the wall. But for a chance to be with you, I will talk shit about H&M. It's been five years since they married, three years since they stepped down as royals, two years since their infamous interview with Oprah, one year since the queen died. <laughs> I can't believe these two idiots are still in the news, but here we are. Today, I want to talk about the Cold War of the last five years. What is going on between Harry and Charles? Harry used to think Granny was the weakest link, and now he seems to think it's his father. I think H&M wouldn't know the long game if it smacked them upside the head with a royal scepter. The first thing I want to chat about is the housing crisis. No, no, H&M aren't doing anything to alleviate or prevent homelessness. Why would they bother with a thing like that? I'm talking about their housing crisis. Ever since they were evicted from Frogmore, Harry's had to sleep on Elton John's couch when he goes back to London for his various lawsuits, I guess. Or maybe ask Beatrice's husband if he has any model apartments to crash in, because we know no hotel is good enough for him, and he no longer has any childhood friends to stay with, and he's no longer welcome to crash in Brooklyn Beckham's old room, so where do you think Harry is staying? Soho House? We know he has too much pride to ask his father, the largest landowner in the UK, for a guest room. Do you think he's already copping freebies in exchange for future SpawnCon that we'll find out about soon enough on Megan's ceaselessly hyped forthcoming return to Instagram? Doing a little research on this, I did find that Jumaira magazine quote from 2015, where Megan said she loved their service departments, quote, I can give you the most honest answer. It's my favorite property I've ever stayed at. I'm very fortunate that I have the luxury of staying at so many amazing places, but the service and being able to stay somewhere where it feels like home, where every need is anticipated, it's all fantastic. I really love love it here, and I'm happy to be staying. I'm even happy that I don't have to fib, end quote. <laughs> what a weird thing to say. I'm even happy that I don't have to fib, straight up confessing that all of her other SponCon is a lie. I don't know if she's going to be the most effective Instagram influencer. Now, when H&M said in their Netflix special and countless interviews that they believe the royal family reads all the tabloids, and adjust their behavior accordingly. I couldn't really tell if they were truly delusional or if they were trying to bullshit us into believing their story that the royal family turned on them or if it was just another example of a narcissist needing to believe and have others believe that they are so important that everyone is thinking about them and living for them all the time even when they're not around. But as time has gone on, their pattern of floating what they want in the press, seeing if, who, and how anyone responds, and then and demanding retractions, denying, or adjusting their message has become so, so obvious through repetition, it really can't be denied. They tried it way back when with getting invited to ex-President Obama's birthday party. They tried it with advertising Dior. Actually, put your favorite example of the float and deny in the comments below so I know you know what I'm talking about. When they know they've really, really fucked up, they demand retractions and issue legal threats and and media outlets making conservative financial decisions do weigh the benefits and often comply. The most recent example of this that springs to mind is all the pictures of Megan grinning and posing in the back of the yellow cab during the supposedly life-threatening car chase in New York City that mysteriously disappeared just two hours after the public reaction to their publicist's ridiculous statement was really not good. But recently it's happened again. On August 
August 7th, OK Magazine published an article quoting a Sussex insider about H&M asking to rent a specific apartment at Kensington Palace and offering to refurbish it at their own expense. Quote, Harry and Meghan are offering to rent an apartment at Kensington Palace and furnish it themselves. He hopes that will please William and show that they're serious about coming back, end quote. Now, we can find mention of this OK Magazine article all over. The Express, The Examiner, The Daily Record, Yorkshire Live, PerezHilton.com, etc., etc. It was discussed the following morning on Sky News, but the original OK Magazine article with the sourced insider, gone with the wind. Let me set up a timeline for you so you can understand H&M's tabloid maneuverings prior to making this insane ask. On August 2nd, the Megan's softer approach to the royal family article that I discussed in my last gossip video came out, again in multiple outlets, clearly from a Sussex source. The very next day, a Sussex source tells the Mirror, quote, This isn't how she envisioned things would turn out, but Megan knows the truth and will tell anyone who will listen that Kate had an edge to her, end quote. Initially, this looks like a head scratcher. Wasn't Megan taking a softer approach? But it all comes together shortly. The next day, August 4th, the story is about Harry and Meghan not being invited to the royal family's private memorial for Queen Elizabeth all came out. The very same day, Charles leaks that he didn't plan a party, so there's actually nothing for them to not be invited to shut up. The same day, people noticed the royals hadn't wished Meghan a happy birthday on Instagram. The same day, Meghan leaks her secret Insta account. For the five millionth time, by the way, we've been hearing about this shit since at least January, if not before. Obviously, she wasn't amassing followers as quickly as she hoped she would because she keeps pummeling us with this as if it's a story. Looking at the most recent news 18 hours ago, 10 hours ago, 7 hours ago, Megan's new secret account amasses over 100,000 followers. Megan Markle's new Insta Instagram rakes in 100,000 followers without sharing one single post. Thousands flock to see first move on Megan Instagram account. She doesn't even care if people have genuine interest. She's just desperately trying to trigger herd mentality. The same day, the article about how Megan wears the pants in the family and she makes the decisions for Harry and that works for them comes out, quote, Megan does seem to run the household and make the decisions, but it's not that he bends for her. It's just a dynamic that works for them and maybe one that he needs after everything he's been through, end quote the insider ads. So a real rush. Two days later, an article comes out saying Eugenie and Beatrice can't deal with the drama anymore. <laughs> and that same day, the KP ask is issued. Then there's a curious silence for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, Invictus, the hairdresser, the dentist, whatever, but nothing about Harry's trip to London or the big ask. Within a week, there's a pop shot of Megan dining with one of her WME agents. I wonder what was so important to warrant an in-person meeting. Six days later, all the articles come out saying that Megan will not be joining Harry in London. Within five days, a rash of articles claiming that September 17th peace talk day and time is confirmed. And within 10 days, another cycle of articles saying, actually, there will be no peace talks. The King and Prince of Wales do not care to see Harry. I know I'm an evil person because the quotes from the royal source, which is clear William crack me up. The phrases are <laughs> no chance, utterly betrayed, and absolutely disgusted. Doesn't that sound just like him when he was yelling at that guy taking pictures of him riding a bicycle with his kids? You're outrageous. You're disgusting. You really are. I dare you behave like that. You want to have this altercation? You can have this altercation. Secretaries, keep a cool head and prevaricate on your behalf. <laughs> we know those statements came straight from him. So isn't the timing of all that terribly interesting? My theory is that Harry doesn't want to reconcile with his family, but does feel he's entitled to the best address in town. So he and Megan, in their audacity, cooked up the plan to ask for a Kensington Palace apartment. They knew it was a long shot and they needed an extremely powerful manipulation strategy, but isn't that what they're paying hundreds of thousands of 
$1,500 for a year back in California. Harry struggled to even get a meeting with Charles, but eventually did with the assurance that Megan would not be present or involved. But as soon as the meeting was secured, Megan and her brilliant reps thought that if they floated the idea in the press of H&M moving into Kensington Palace and managed to define that in the public imagination as a sure sign of reconciliation, healing, growth, and harmony within the British royal family, and even more vitally, proof positive that the British royal family was in fact not racist, Megan never said that, and we're all suffering from a mass delusion perpetrated by the devilish, conspiratorial British press, they could sell that back to Charles as a redemption arc so good he couldn't say no. To them, with their short-sighted Hollywood mentality, this makes sense. They're concerned about image and believe a forgetful public has a short attention span. They thought this was such a win-win slam dunk that they could push it way too far, as narcissists are wont to do. The content and sequence of those articles was no coincidence. Megan was dictating her terms, thinking she held the power in the situation. Of course, they deserve more for such magnanimous forgiveness, namely a total upending of the existing power dynamic, wherein they get to do whatever they want and treat people however they like. By the way, Megan will be returning as the boss. She will make business decisions for Harry, she will have a private Instagram and run her SponCon game from a royal address, and it will be her whims that dictate Kate's behavior towards her, not Kate's own conscience or centuries of established royal etiquette. Thank you so much. Obviously, Charles is concerned about lifetime legacy and how he will be judged in history textbooks centuries from now. So of course he said, absolutely not. I'm King Charles. I don't need to be the people's princess. Don't even darken my door if all you're going to do is ask for more, more, more from me again. And by the way, stop trying to break all of your brother's toys. And then the legal threats went out and the OK article was pulled. What do you think? Do you think I'm on to something here? What I find even more intriguing about this is what it shows us about the depths of narcissism H&M wallow in. Narcissists believe they can shame other people into covering their tracks. They thought they could make Charles look like an unloving Grinch for leaving Harry homeless and without security in the UK and giving Lily Bucks and Arch TM the silent treatment. And that given the option, Charles would give them what they wanted in exchange for not having to endure their smear campaign. Perhaps they even put the never knowing his grandchildren blame and guilt on Charles directly and personally in some communique with his secretary when it's obviously their fault. Narcissists really think that everyone else either genuinely accepts their bad behavior as the knowing and correct actions of a superior creature, or we accept their behavior because they wield such power to harm us. We mere mortals are forced to accept their version of history, reality, and how things stand. H&M really didn't know that Charles does not accept them in any way. Narcissists never really get it when people set boundaries with them. They assume their adversaries are silent because they've tricked them or cowed them into submission. And that's why they keep checking for compliance. They compulsively test boundaries again and again. I think H&M and all their little minions genuinely believed that Charles was pretending everything was okay to avoid embarrassment and that he invited Harry to the coronation and he invited Harry to the post-coronation lunch because he knew he was wrong and Harry was right. And he really does regret not having Meghan sign that NDA, like she keeps telling us. It probably never occurred to them that Charles was silent, not silenced. I bet Charles wrote Harry off a long time ago, probably the day he slandered him. He invited Harry to that stuff for posterity because he has good manners and wanted to draw attention to the right things about the day, not the wrong things about the day. Nothing more. If they haven't shamed or maligned him into action thus far, today's not the day either. Surprise! A literal king 
is not the one. Another delusional narcissistic element at play here is that they still think they call the shots. They want to make amends when they want to, how they want to, for their own reasons. They hurt people for profit. They hurt people for spite. They hurt people for sport. They certainly don't seem to care about people they hurt simply as collateral damage. They most definitely do not see that even if Charles were to accept them back into the fold in some capacity or house them in some royal residence, he would never consign Catherine to up close daily personal surveillance and abuse from a woman who has targeted her and tried to hurt her and humiliate her publicly so many times. They really think they can summon King Charles to peace talks at Harry's convenience the day after an awards ceremony he would already be in Europe for or whatever, when Harry couldn't even be bothered to stay an hour for lunch. He told the world freely, completely sure he was right, that his son's fourth birthday was more important than his father's coronation. The time difference from London to LA is eight hours. The flight time is just over 11 hours. If Harry left after lunch, he'd still make it back for a late dinner. Also, the kid is four. He doesn't know what day his birthday is. I don't think Harry is ever getting a meeting with Charles again. Just the thought of them trying it. Trying it in the press trying it through legal representation, trying it personally, just the thought of Harry begging some secretary he hates over the phone and shit talked in his book, it really makes me chuckle. Speaking of courtiers whose unparalleled loyalty and patriotism forced them to go above and beyond simply by enduring Harry and his wife, the bee himself, Sir Edward Young, has been honored and promoted by King Charles. Quote, the king has been pleased to appoint the Lord Young of Old Windsor to be a permanent lord in waiting to his majesty. End quote. In spare, Harry blames Edward directly of preventing him from seeing his grandmother and taking away his Scotland Yard security detail when he was in Canada. Harry called him the bee because he is, quote, oval faced and fuzzy and glides around with great equanimity and poise. End quote. I don't know, Harry sounds like a compliment to me. Poised, fair, a full head of hair. <laughs> Not really a stinger, Harry. Okay, I'm done, but. Harry despises the now Lord Young so much that he named him specifically in one of his ridiculous lawsuits, claiming that if Edward's input hadn't been taken into account, the committee that decided against continuing to provide Metropolitan Police security to Harry and the fam might have made a different decision. To this accusation, the Home Office really came out swinging with their lawyer, Sir James Eady. It's Eady, not Eddie, right? Let me know in the comments below. Saying, quote, the claimant, Harry, now refers to objections he might have made to any role being played by officials of the royal household in Ravex decision making. Ravex stands for the Royal and VIP Executive Committee. Apparently, because of personal tensions he felt with them, that there's no bias challenge and any such tensions are irrelevant to the undisputed fact of the claimant's change in status, which led to the decision of Ravex. The inability of the claimant even now to explain how a process of representations could or would have assisted is striking. There's no basis for the court to conclude that it would be anything other than highly likely that allowing claimants additional representations would not have led to their decision being substantially different or even at all different. <laughs> and here's the important part that keeps going over Harry's head. Personal protective security by the police is not available on a privately financed basis and Ravek does not make decisions on the provision of such security on the basis that any financial contribution could be sought or obtained to pay for it, end quote. Why doesn't Harry get this? He is not above the law. He does not own the police. The police are not to be bought and sold. Harry is an ex-royal, not the head of an organized crime syndicate. He doesn't get to pay off the police. Another really interesting tidbit that came out during that trial was the judge reprimanded Harry and his representation for leaking embargoed court documents 
emailing them to Megan, who could then email them to whoever, or perhaps emailing them to his publisher as part of the fact-checking process, or God forbid, emailing them directly to media outlets. The unintended recipients of the embargoed court documents is not revealed, but clearly Harry and his team seriously fucked up. To quote Mr. Justice Swift, Editing the court documents avoids the risk that putting information into the public domain concerning security arrangements made on past occasions and the general approach to whether and if so what arrangements should be made may impair the effectiveness of arrangements in place now or which may be put in place in the future. Information about these matters would self-evidently be of interest to anyone wishing to harm a person within the scope of the security arrangements and would assist them to piece together previous practice with a view to anticipate present or future security provision. Emailing embargoed court documents against court rules to anyone who is not a lawyer is entirely unacceptable, a clear breach. It should have been obvious that what happened was a breach. At the very least, it should have been obvious that it needed to be reported to the judge, me, as soon as possible. It is also unacceptable that you come without an apology to the court, end quote. In other words, Harry wasn't just being a jerk by referencing the be the wasp and the fly, and relaying what he believed to be their influence in decision-making around royal security, he was serving up bribe and threat targets on a silver platter to the millions of readers of Spare and anyone who might read reviews or news about the book, not to mention any nasty little tidbits that made their way barely anonymized into the Netflix special and their ever-flowing barrage of anonymous Sussex insider sourced publicity releases to the tabloids. Harry talks so much about non-existent dangers to his family, but has no perception of the various ways he endangers other people, primarily the royal family and their staff. For a dumb guy, he is certainly a layered, nuanced dickhead. At least Charles appreciates these guys that work for him. Quote, His Majesty has great respect for Lord Young and is grateful for all the work he did for his mother, often under great pressure. This new honor is a reflection of that. End quote. So what do you think is really going on between Charles and Harry? Silent? Silenced? Silent treatment? Gray rocking? I don't believe Charles talks to Harry through the press. I think he hears him loud and clear. Let me know your opinions in the comments below, and I will see you tomorrow for a more lighthearted gossip video. Toodles! Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Bye.